feet. When I left my load of sin at Jesus' feet. Let's sing it again. My load at Calvary. Where Jesus died for you and me. And then there came a peace so sweet. When I left my load of sin at Jesus' feet. <clears throat> Number 107, I'm sure we can testify to this, that the Lord Jesus has taken our empty lives and he's filled it not only with his peace, um, but with his joy and with his love. And that all means more since we've come to know him as our personal saviour. 107. took my empty life and he filled it with his peace. Now peace means more than it did before, for it comes from Jesus my Lord. Jesus took my empty life and he filled <coughs> with his joy. Now joy means more than it did before, for it comes from Jesus my Lord. Jesus took my empty life and he filled it with his peace. Now love means more than it did before, for it comes from Jesus my Lord. Thought you knew that one a bit better. <laughs> yeah, sorry you had to listen to my voice through that. Number 41. He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee. <clears throat> He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, <coughs> but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. He has shown thee. O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. So at the bottom of the page there, number 47. Having come through this Easter time and been able to reflect, it's wonderful to know that we serve a risen Savior. And despite what's happening in the world around us, um, God is in control. He's never lost control. He never will lose control. But it's wonderful to know that this risen Savior, we are able to have alive within our hearts. Um, just reminded of that verse, that he's, he that has begun a good work on you, in you, wants to perform it or wants to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We heard about the soon return of the Lord this morning. And so I can have a peace in my heart, despite the circumstances, despite the fear that may be there. And the fear is real. 
Um, but our Savior is alive, and we can rejoice in that this morning. Number 47. He's alive and I'm forgiven, the stone's been rolled away. He's alive and I'm forgiven, he's no longer where he lay. He's alive and I'm forgiven, yeah, the angels say, let all the world rejoice for he's alive. Let's sing it again. He's alive and I'm forgiven, the stone's been rolled away. He's alive and I'm forgiven, he's no longer where he lay. He's alive and I'm forgiven, I can hear the angels say, Let all the world rejoice for he's alive. Before we sing our last chorus, Tim, can I ask you to commit the meeting to the Lord in prayer, please? Thanks. Let's close our eyes. Father, we just want to thank you so much for this privilege to come and hear your word this morning. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you will anoint Conrad with um, the Holy Spirit as he speaks, Lord, that it will be your words that we hear, not his, Lord, um, that you will soften each one of our hearts and, um, Lord, just that you would draw us to yourself. We know that no one can come to you except you draw them. And so, Lord, uh, we just pray that you'll draw each and every one of us, soften our hearts, Lord, and uh, even those of us who do know and love you, Lord, that you would just um, help us not to not to be blinded just because of pride or anything, Lord, but to, to just soften our hearts and to be open to what you have to say to us, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks. <clears throat> Let's sing as a last... I think it's in the hymn section, 202. How many people in this world would love to hear these words? You never need to worry, you never need to fear. Um, and as God's children, those words are real. There's no need to worry, no need to fear, because I'm ever by your side. <clears throat> Let's sing this through and then we'll hand over to Conrad. To share with us. 202. In the, sorry, the white book, the hymn section at the back. <clears throat> 202. I am a new creation. No more in condemnation, here in the grace of God I stand. My heart is overflowing, my love just keeps on growing, here in the grace of God I stand. And I will Praise you, Lord, I will praise you, Lord, I will sing of <coughs> a joy that knows no limit, a lightness in my spirit, here in the grace of God I stand. I never need to worry, I never need to fear for, I know you're ever by my side. And when the storm starts raging, when troubles fill my mind, then I can just run to you and hide. And I will praise you, Lord, I will praise you, Lord, I will sing of all that you have done, a 
joy that knows no limit, a lightness in my spirit, here in the grace of God. And chorus again. And I will praise you, Lord, I will praise you, Lord, I will sing of all that you have done. A joy that knows no limits, a likeness in my spirit, here in the grace of God I say. Morning, everyone. Can I just ask for some water, please? A glass of water. <coughs> right. I can talk about the Word of God all day. Thank you. <laughs> but it's good to stay within a time frame because of the capacity of our minds. Some days we think we're clever and then we meet someone cleverer than us and you sort of feel a little smaller than you were before. But I pray that we don't feel smaller in the eyes of God, but that we feel like we're his children and that we belong and that we in his will. And so I want to share just a little bit from the first couple of chapters in the Bible. It's always a good place to start at the beginning. But it's also good to continue to hear the end of the conversation. But let's, this morning, just reflect on how things started and where it put us in history and where it puts us in the eyes of God. There are people with I'll take that as well. Thanks. There are people with opinions and they never really compare their opinion to the will of God. And they wonder why they're lost. And some end up lost for the rest of their lives. What a sad position to be in. I'm thankful that I found Jesus because he found me first. And I know that I'm kept. And just by means of testimony, last Sunday, I could not get out of bed. It was physically impossible. I had Craig's flu, and that's what we're calling it now. So if you have flu, <laughs> thanks, Craig. But this body of Christ prayed. And so Monday morning, I got out of bed and I went to work. Other people are down for two, three weeks, somewhere in hospital. The Lord raised me in 24 hours. And so I give glory to him. Nothing of this body. This body still suffers. It's aging. It's telling me that it's aging. And it is not heaven bound. This body is going to stay behind. Thank the Lord for that. But I'm going to be raised in a new body. Not because I say so. Because Jesus says so. And it's going to a place that he is prepared. And you can read in John 14. He confirms that. And the reason why I trust that is because it's impossible for God to lie, and the rather I'll be the liar. I was born a liar. Thank God that he's changed me and that I can stick to the truth. It's a very safe place to be. And so this morning I pray that we share with one another the truth that is written. And so when we look at Genesis 1, God starts by creating. And if I look out this window... I think God's very creative. I could not come up with everything that he created. And I look up at the stars and I can't count them. But God said, I'm just going to put enough out there so I can enjoy them too. God enjoys his, his creative handiwork. And he keeps it in and under his control just by the word of his power. That is powerful. I ask people to move and they don't move. That's how weak we are in our flesh. That we can't even have one individual move for us. 
creation. This entity that no one has seen the beginning of and no one has seen the end of is kept in the palm of God's hand. And he says, more importantly, after creating all of this for six days, I'm going to take a day of rest just to show you an example. Work, but rest. And so to, today we're resting under the sound of God's word. Some of the world are not resting, and you can see why they're restless, because they're never under the sound of God's word. They're under the influence of their own opinions and of the wicked one. And so, chapter 1 in Genesis describes so beautifully the structure that God put in place. The ordinances. Everything was done in sequence. And so I asked Brett, the person who I'm standing in for this morning, just on Thursday, if, and it's impossible, but hypothetically stipulating, if you were able to be God for a day, what would you do? And what would you do different? That's just the thought that came to my mind. In, I have so much to say to him in the things that are not happening in my life or the things that are happening, happening in my life and what would I do different if I were God and in control of everything? I would cause chaos. I would bring utter destruction on those doing wrong. That's what I would do. The, the things that my mind are drawn to of people that I would send to God right now and have them dealt with immediately. But the difference between me and those doing wrong is the absence of God. That is it. Not everything they're doing or not doing, the absence of God. And so when we look at creation, it was perfect, even to the point that God said, I am pleased with what has been done. And then we go into chapter 2, even more beautiful than the creation that he created. He created Adam. And the Godhead met and they said, let's make man in our own image. Let's do something special. Creation was special, but let's do something more, something more special in creating man. And God created Adam. I don't know if he was handsome or a little scruffy to start with. But I think God did a good job after doing creation to such splendor. He would have created Adam to have a few muscles and have good hair, not starting off bald. He had intelligence because God said, everything that I've created, you can name it and you can look after it. So he must have applied wisdom in creating Adam that he had vocabulary to name everything. And then he gave him wisdom to look after everything. And then he said, I see you're alone. I don't want you to be a lone ranger. I'm going to create a help. And so through perfection in the creation that he made Adam, he took Eve out of Adam. A lot of principles there that we can pick up in how God created the whole creation and how he created Adam and Eve can be applied in our spiritual lives. Man just chooses not to see it. And things were good until chapter 3. And so let's just pick up in Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. I just glance over those words so often through my life. In 40 years of reading the scriptures, yes, there was Satan, and then there was Adam and Eve, and there was this conversation. But just to focus that he was the most deceitful being at that time. And so he approaches Eve, and he, he doesn't talk about creation. He doesn't talk about the things that they're busy with in running the Garden of Eden, he immediately attacks what God says. He goes straight 
to the most important conversation. What did God say? And so deceitful, he says, in this conversation we're having, God said a few things. But I think he said it in a different way. So from my point of view, my opinion, I want you to see it from a different viewpoint. And Eve said, okay, let me entertain what you're saying. Let's, let's discuss it. Let's break it apart. Let's break it open and, and see what, what you're saying. And he said, man, God loves you guys and he, he created you and he's given you authority over everything here. He's not going to destroy you. He loves you guys. And so let's, let's just participate of, of what he, he said we shouldn't do, but he didn't really mean it. And she said, okay, I understand God loves us and, you know, he, he walks with us and he talks and he's given us responsibilities and we're doing it well. Maybe he's not so bad that he'll punish us. I don't know how long that conversation was. But man, it had devastating end to it. Because then Eve said, Hubby, you know, I had this conversation and I don't want your opinion. I just want you to share in this because this stuff is good, man. I thought it was going to have a real bad effect because God said, we mustn't be naughty and take of this tree. And so he entertains a little deliberation. Instead of putting his foot down saying, man, God said. And so he's entertaining this thought of, you're still alive and, you know, the serpent hasn't run away. And so let me have some. And it was good. He enjoyed it. He didn't reprimand Eve or rebuke her. What have you done to me? You know, I'm busy dying. It was good because everything that God created was good. But not good for them at that moment in time. Verse 5, sorry, verse 4. And then the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. How does he know that? Because he experienced the same thing. When you go back to before Adam and Eve, Satan had a little deliberation with some of the angels on the side, and he said, I think I'm equal with God. What do you guys think? Maybe. A third of the angels said, yes, you are. And Lucifer, in Satan, went to God and said, I am equal with you. What do you think about it? And God said, this is my law. This is my structure. This is how everything is created. That how, that's how you were created. One of the most powerful angels, most beautiful. You had a responsibility to do. And you've neglected that. You wanted to take on my responsibility. And so I'm not going to crush you, but my law is going to deal with you. And so he was cast out. He wasn't killed. He wasn't destroyed. He was put out. No more place in the presence of God. And so that's how he could be so deceitful and go down to man and say, listen, God's not really going to kill you. Try this. And so he was unhappy because he could never spend any more time in the presence of God. Under the love of God. And so he'd been dealt the wrath of God. And so I don't know about you, but... When there's a group of you and you get caught being naughty. Do you run up to the front and say, it was me, it was me, punish me, please. No. This oak was with me and this oak was with me and that oak was with me. And that oak was running away, but he was with me. And we try and bring in as many people as possible to share this burden of punishment. So God does meet with them. Their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened to who God really was. 
and to who they could really be without God. And so what's the first thing they do? They don't run to God and say, listen, we've made a terrible mistake. We're sorry. They run out of his presence. And so every evening God wanted to meet with his people and have fellowship with his people. It was personal. But they were nowhere to be found. And so it's ironic that God says, where are you guys? But God knew where they were all along. He wanted them to acknowledge where they were. Not in the presence of God, but they had left the safest place they could have found themselves. And they ran and they hid themselves. And they started covering up their sin. What a place of desperation. That the very one you have fellowship with, you run from. The very creation, the vessel he created them to live in, they started covering it up. And so I don't know about you, but that started drawing my mind and my heart to a point of searching. And God asking, Conrad, where are you? Am I running? Am I hiding? Am I covering up? Conrad, where are you? It's on the eve of the day we're supposed to have fellowship. I might be running for the hills for what I did in the morning. So God creates this perfect, falseless creation. He creates this special place for Adam and Eve. And he says, don't do one thing. Just don't do it. Everything else you can do. And so you ask a child, there's the line. Don't step over it. They're going to test it. Why? we inquisitive people, but for the wrong reason. And so why aren't people reading the Bible trying to find out who this God is and where he is? And they look in creation and they try and disprove a creator. Instead of trying to find out the detail, the mic mic microscopic detail that he went down to in creating little cells and good bacteria and the whole ecosystem, how it works and how the stars don't all collide and how the, the planets just stay where they should be. Man doesn't want to know that. They want to write a book of opinions of my opinion is this and this is why I'm backing it because that's what I saw with my finite mind. It's devastating. And yet, here's this God who meets with him and everything availed to them. And they named everything and they're looking after it and it's, it's pristine. But because of compromise back then, devastation. And Satan now is trying with this whole green approach and making creation God. You've got to worship this God. We're busy destroying it. It's not going to last long enough. Rubbish! I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but when God creates things and he says there's going to be a point where I'm going to destroy it, it will last until then. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't wake up 3,000 years later going, oh my goodness, I should have made it a little better so it would last. Six days he created, then he rested. Then he started with man. And he's still working with man. It brings emotions that stir up in me. Why would God still be struggling with us? Because he loves us. Conrad, you got it wrong again. <laughs> no. Conrad, examine your heart. And find what is in your heart. And what's not there, allow me to take it out. And not just do a little trimming session. Not sprinkling. Rip it out by the root. 
clean it out. Allow me to occupy that space. And that's all what God wanted to do from the beginning. To occupy that space of Eden with his special people that he created. But we listen to that crafty one. Eve repeated exactly what God had said. And then she doubted. Because someone else said something different. And that's why we need to get to grips with the word of God. That's the truth. That's the benchmark. Nothing can change it. You can bring evidence against it. It will stand the test of time. She heard what God had said. She understood it and then she took another opinion. They compromised. And after they sinned, they blamed. Conrad, you've got to stop blaming other people for what's happening in your life. Two things happen in my life. The consequences of my actions or God bringing about circumstances to bring maturity and to test my faith and to exercise my faith and to mature my faith. The same in your life. You examine your heart and what God's bringing about in your life to mature you. It's not easy. But it's so worth it. The Lord Jesus had to take them and take them out of his presence and put them out so they would not take of that tree. The tree of life. And God cursed the earth. And he said to Satan, there's your curse. And he said to Eve, there's your curse. And he said to Adam, there's your curse. I think that was quite just. And not killing him or her or destroying them, but gave them an opportunity. Like I said before, if I was God for one day, some people would not be anymore. But the grace of God said, I'm going to send my son to die. There's an opportunity for everyone. And there's mercy and there's grace and there's forgiveness. But don't keep testing it. Isn't that lovely? Opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And you keep saying, God, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. And God says, I know. I understand. It's been from the beginning. But my grace is sufficient for you. So when my love is in your life, I'm going to embrace you no matter what. Genesis 4, Cain and Abel. Just things were different for Adam and Eve, and they had to start living a different lifestyle, and they had to start turning the soil and planting and growing, and it became like us in our daily routine. I pray that God changes our daily routine, not to just go out and to slave away but to live for him. And so they had two children, Cain and Abel, and I imagine they started off as youngsters enjoying life and then having to go out and and live life and work for their daily bread. And so Cain was working in the garden and Abel was a shepherd. Same as we have to choose what we have to do every day. But we still have to sacrifice our lives to the one who created us. To the one who came and laid down his life for us. And so they too were sacrificing. And I read a few different translations just to to have it pop out at me. To to color in the gray. And Cain and Abel were both busy with their daily tasks. And when it came time to sacrifice, Cain just said, there, I've given you something. And he sacrificed his vegetables. Abel, on the other hand, it says he took 
the best lamb of his flock. And he sacrificed that to the Lord Jesus. And so when we, when we sacrifice our daily time, do we give the Lord the scraps? I've given you some time. Or do you give him the best of your day? When you're the most focused, or you're dedicating that to your job so you can earn money. That's what came into my heart. What does the Lord get out of my day every day? Jesus gave in the Garden of Eden the best time. When the sun's busy setting, bird life coming alive, coolness in the day, time to relax. And he said, I want to relax with you. I want to hear how your day was. Talk to me. And so we could go days, some weeks, months. The Lord saying, where are you? I want to talk to you. I miss our conversations. How am I going to invest in your life if you don't communicate? Abel offered the best that he had. God rejected Cain's sacrifice and accepted Abel's. Is God accepting your sacrifice? Or you're giving him the scraps and saying, that's good enough. Or I don't have any more to give. Or I've given all I have and this is all I have left. God sent Jesus the best that he had to go and pay a price that he didn't owe. And to set you free from something you got yourself involved in. And he says, I want to take you out of it. Won't you give me your best? Do you know what your best is? With your whole heart, with your whole mind, with your whole being, that is your best. Or we're selling ourselves off to the world out there. Things started off bad. It continued to go bad until the point where God said, I'm done. I'm going to destroy the earth with water. And so he did. But he gave opportunity for a hundred years. His servant preached for a hundred years. And everyone heard. But only the family of eight climbed in. Those who were building the ark were in the ark. Strange, eh? With over two million people, no one came to help. Everyone heard the chatter. Everyone was pointing and mocking. You're stupid. You're talking about something that hasn't happened. What's wrong with you? No one said, it's going to rain because God said so. God's wrath is coming. And it did. And we look now where the Lord Jesus in his word says, is now worse than in the days of Noah. How do you think God feels, having come from the Garden of Eden <laughs> to where we find ourselves now? There is a terrible day coming for those who aren't building the Church of God and who are not found in the body of Christ. Those who are not hearing the voice of God. Those who are not walking with Him in the cool of the day. You read... And I shared the other day on Revelation 1 to 4. There was a warning to the churches. Seven of them. And then Revelation 6 to 16. Terrible things coming. People say that I want to read the book of Revelation because they don't understand it. You think God wants to keep us confused? Because he says, even a child can understand the word of God and get to know God and become a child of God. And so some of it is complicated. I'll agree with that. But you ask God to give you a revelation. Start by asking him to give you a revelation of who he is and who he is in your life. And if he's not in your life, ask him to come in and he will. 
You want to know more about him. Spend time with him and you'll get to know him. He will share the bountiful knowledges of who he is. And the more you follow him and the more you hear him, the more you will become like him. I'm astonished every now and then when I hear Beth. Beth is a 13-year-old girl and she's, she's my daughter. And she says things the way I say them. And you turn around and shock and I'm creating a monster. No, no, she's following in my footsteps and she's hearing what I'm saying. And sometimes she does what I do. And I need to be careful what I say and do. The same with all of us. Be careful what you say and do because the world out there is watching. And so Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And I'd love for us all to say, follow me, the world out there, because I'm following Christ. Can they see Christ in you? There's a lot of amazing things in the Word. And so now more than ever, it's time to exercise them. We need to emphasize that. We heard a bit this morning about Israel. They're going to get something different to what we're having. But they God's people and God will take care of them. We are the Gentiles. And God will take care of us. And he will keep us. And he'll come to take us home. Let's find ourselves in the cool of the day communicating with God. Let's give him our best sacrifice. If not the scraps that we find available here and there. God is an awesome God, but He's also a consuming fire. And there's a day coming where He's going to judge those who did not choose Him, who did not sacrifice their life, who did not accept the sacrifice of Jesus. I don't want to go there. I want to talk about the hope that is within us, the hope that awaits us, the hope waking up tomorrow morning, The breath that Jesus has given you. Won't you find him walking before you as he leads and guides you? Won't you be listening for that still small voice as he's asking you to do things and other things to run away from? Let's not embrace the opinions of people, but rather hear what they're saying and confirming it with the word of God. We have a spirit of discernment within us. We can hear what's out there. Amen. Paul? Thanks, Conrad. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, the... The onus is on us. What are we going to do with what the Lord has offered to us? And, you know, we hear much about the body of Christ, but there'll be a day where I have to stand before the Lord as an individual. Um, and it will be, the question will be asked, what have you done with my son? Um, and the word says, there'll be many that said, Lord, I did this and I did this. Um, and the Lord's response is, depart from me, I never knew you. And so this morning I pray <clears throat> that as the Lord has ministered to our hearts that we would just carefully consider what he's asking us to do. He's not asking us to um, to leave something that's good and come to him and be worse off. Um, he's calling us, where it says, out of darkness. He wants tr- to translate us into the kingdom of his dear son. He wants to take us from darkness into light. He wants to <clears throat> open blind eyes. Um, he wants to give forgiveness. And as Conrad said, he wants to give us his love. Um, and that's available to anyone. There's no, no one's disqualified from coming to the Lord. And so I just pray that we'll, we'll just think on on the message that we've heard this morning that will just allow those words to have an impact. Um, everything I hear has to, it ends in a decision. 
not making a decision is making one. Um, Lord, may I, may I find myself in the right standing be before you this morning. And um, yeah, we'll close in prayer. But really, just it's it's me before the Lord. That's just what I've been challenged with this morning. It's Lord, where am I? <clears throat> We've had the breaking of bread meeting where we're encouraged to ask ourselves that question. But even again now, Lord, where am I before you? Take away all the show and all the things I have in my mind and all my insecurities, all my, but Lord, where am I before you? And you know, the Lord will show us. He's not going to withhold anything from us. Um, he just looks for that willing heart that's prepared to, that searching willing heart. And he'll, he'll meet us wherever we are. Amen. So thank the Lord for that. <clears throat> Let's close with a, a hymn. Him, white book. Um, is it a, even a, creates me a clean heart? What number is that? Twenty-three. Let's stand and sing this, and I pray that this is the the crown each of our hearts this morning. Lord, create in, in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. thank you for the word that you shared with us this morning and Father just here in your heart and even as we've sung those words Lord that as individuals before you Lord we just pray that you would examine our hearts and Lord that you would create those right spirits within us Father those things that we've built up those walls those barriers that we've we've put up Lord to to secure ourselves to to make ourselves feel safe to perhaps protect ourselves Father, we just pray that those would all be done away with in the light of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Father, the work that you want to do in our hearts is a good work. It's an honest work, Father. It's an eternal work. And I pray that we would allow, allow you to do that work in our hearts. Father, just meet us wherever we are, Lord. Challenge our hearts, we pray, that it would spur us on to make a decision to give our lives to you. Father, not half-heartedly, but fully committed, even as we've heard the example of your Son and that he went to the cross uh, Father, fulfilling your will, that all would come to him. Father, we can't blame anyone, even as Adam tried to blame me. Father, we stand before you as individuals and pray, Lord, 
uh, search our hearts. Lord, know us. See, try our reign. See if there any be if there be any wicked way in us. And Lord, lead us in those paths of righteousness. For your sake, we pray. We just commit ourselves to you as we would part, Father, for this week ahead, that you would just lead and guide us. Father, whatever challenges we would face, Father, we'd just be able to stand firm on, on this foundation that has been laid in our hearts, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we just commit ourselves as we part now in Jesus' name. Amen.